Okay, so this is the first in-class meeting of applications of deep neural networks. Let me actually see if I can turn down the lights a little bit. Yeah, that's better. Now we can see the screen. So what you'll want to do for this class, so in the in-class meetings, I'm not going to make them just completely redundant of the recorded material. So what I am going to do in each of these class sessions is kind of go over what I think is the important parts of it and the parts that are more confusing. So tonight we're going, I'm going to show you a few things on assignment submission and also just the basics of TensorFlow and how to get that um, active and then some other information about the class. So usually these classes are two and a half hours long so I I have a break somewhere in the middle of that. Uh, usually ends up being around 730 and then I'll let you know when that comes up. So probably the last hour I will probably last 45 minutes or so of this class session I will give for time if you need me to help you specifically one-on-one -on -one with any or any direct questions on these. So most of the classes will be set up like that. If you have questions, since we're really only meeting four times during the semester, your best avenue there is Piazza, which I give you a link to. You can basically post questions there. You can always um, email me a question. And in semesters previous, that was very common for students to email me. Usually, if you have a question about your program, include your program um, in your Jupyter notebook file or your Python source file, and let me know what error you're getting, and I can usually help you through that. I know for the first assignment, which is due, I think, in a couple of days, which is really just testing to see if your environment is, is working, um, two of you, anyway, have asked me questions already about that, and I've responded to what, what is causing the, uh, the particular error. So that, and let me also show you, too, if you have not yet installed Anaconda Python, which is what we're going to be using on your computer, and you want to start that process while kind of while the, the the course is going on you can you can get that by if you just google anaconda python it will take you right to where you can download it actually it's probably best just to go to anaconda directly download Anaconda. I also have a whole video of, of how to do this. So it's, you'll want Python, you'll want 3.6 and you'll want the 64-bit version. And it should tell you, it should detect your operating system and get you to the, uh, to the correct one. All of the class information, if you just do a search on Wustel Jeff Heaton, that'll always take you right to the, the class website. I do have a link to it in Blackboard. So Blackboard is the learning management system that we're using this semester. You'll see all your grades posted there as I go through, uh, as we go through the semester. But I'll just go right to the course website. So all of the information that you'll need for this class is on GitHub. So I have a GitHub repository there. You don't necessarily need to know very much about GitHub. It's a good thing to know about, uh, but where this button that says clone or download, if you download the zip, you'll get all of the class files as of this point anyway. I will probably make changes to it as the class um, goes along. So these are just all of the class files for this um, for this semester. I don't really use PowerPoint for presentations. What I use is Jupyter Notebooks, which basically lets you intermix um, intermix 
textual HTML type information, images, and, and other things. So if you go to the, the Jupyter or the uh, GitHub, you will see basically the, the entire uh, schedule for the semester. So the, the in-class meetings, I tried to time these around sort of major um, uh, sort of points in the, in the semester. So the first one, this is just kind of the getting started. This lets make sure that uh, if you have any questions on the environment or how to set up, set up Python, this is definitely a, a technical course. So if you don't like coding, you probably won't like this course very much. You don't have to be extremely good at it. I give you a lot of sample code on the Jupyter Notebooks. So sort of what I view my job as, as the instructor for this course is I went through sort of all of the technologies that you would want to go through with TensorFlow and created examples that are all in these notebooks that way, since the examples are all from the same person doing the same version of TensorFlow, they're all very consistent. So you can this; these are all of the material, all of the material modules. There was a module last week, um, just because I line it to the week. Some it just depends on the semester and how it lines up with Martin Luther King Day and Labor Day and other various things. Sometimes I have, uh, I would have 14, sometimes I would have 15. It just mattered how it lined up. So I just lined these up to one a week. The meetings are here. The last, um, the last two meetings, I try to line those up sort of with projects. So you, you may or may not have heard of Kaggle, but Kaggle is pretty interesting. It is, they call it competitive, I guess, competitive data science. So it's, they have competitions running all the time to see how well you can build AI to, to solve their, their problems that they post. We won't, for this class, do a real Kaggle competition. I'll put a Kaggle in class is what they call it. And you guys will be able to submit your solutions. You will see how they rank compared to uh, compared to each other. You can submit them either in your real name or in, in a pseudonym, but I'll see the your your final submissions. And then module 12 is when we meet again. And this is for sort of the final project of the class. So the final project of the class you really have two choices here. I will give you the material for sort of a computer security. Is that's definitely a part of the Washington University, um, the the program that this that this class is in. They want some element of security in there, so you have your option of that. However, I know I have um, I have masters and a couple of doctoral students. If you've got an area that you're particularly interested in using deep learning for, whether it's for your own research as academic or just an industry interest, you, you need to email me about it. But uh, if you have an idea, send me an email about that and we can probably come up with something where you, uh, you can do the final project related to a part of deep learning that you're interested for your own research. If you don't want to come up with your own, that's perfectly good, and most students do not. Uh, then I'll I'll give you the data set for the uh, for the final one around module twelve. Okay. So how you are. I want to make sure I cover too how you are graded and assessed for for this class. So this is this is a new format that Washington University is experimenting with, the hybrid class format. I've taught this class for I guess a little over a year and a half. Uh, this is a, I guess the, the 
the fourth semester that I've taught it and I don't teach classes in the summer. So this is this is a bit of a new uh, a new format for it. And all of the material should be there on the on the videos. I still need to add I think about two videos but they're towards the later end of the class and that's for the Kaggle competition and the final um, the final security basically I haven't created those yet so I I can't put the video on there for that for that yet but they'll be added probably a few weeks before we actually get to that now since we don't meet every time one thing that the Washington University was clear about in the in the um, and the requirements to set the class up like this is have something due at have something due weekly not something big so the way that I had this class set up before is I had sort of four bigger assignments the tendency or at least I know what I would have done when I was a student is I would probably end up almost forgetting about the class until something was due and then and then I would probably binge watch all of the videos and <laughs> and get it all done. I'm sure you guys would never, never, never do that, but um, there is something due at the end of each module. Not every module, there's only 10, so through the first 10 modules there is there's a, there's a small assignment due each time. It is a coding assignment. I will show you what a couple of those look like just so that you can um, you can see those. And by the way, we do have this classroom nearly full, so uh, there should be there should be a seat for everybody. There's one over there on the right. There's one up here in the front, and there's that's the other thing we're experimenting with. This class, this is always a very popular class. The first time that we um, ran it, I think we had 12 openings, and that filled very quickly. So we're trying this with 30 and that's part of the online format uh, so we'll should work out okay. I would always end up with somewhere in the mid 20s because I would I would get talked into adding additional students. So so the assignments. The way the assignments work is if you go into the uh, the deep learning, if you go into my repository on GitHub, which you have links to, and there's links to all of the assignments in, uh, in Blackboard. By the way, Washington University is changing from Blackboard to something else, I think, in one semester. So that will be changing at some point. But these are your 10 for the first 10 modules. If you go to assignment one for class one, I always give you the instructions and you should have gotten an email from me a key. If you did not get one of these keys, that's entirely possible because I tried my best to stay on top of students adding and dropping so uh, if you don't have a key for me, just send me an email, jtheaton at wustl.edu. It's on the, it's on the uh, syllabus. And I will definitely, definitely send you one. I think about three quarters of you have already submitted assignment one, which is kind of what I said to do in the, uh, uh, in the instructions, so that's good. There's really no code that you have to write at all on assignment one. It just proves that your environment works. So all you, and I also, you'll want to look at assignment one. It's got some information about common problems, common problems one, two, three, common problem four, question mark, question mark. Like I said, this is the very first semester that, um, that we've taught this course in this format. So you guys are beta testing a little bit, the submission process and all of this. So if anything goes wrong, let me know. If we pass the due date and I um, I don't have your assignment, you'll probably get an email from me because I will be watching it fairly closely just to make sure things are working. Um, so 
these are some of the common problems if you put in a bad student key so all of these all of these uh, assignments I do have a key in there and that was the key that I was using over Christmas break to test everything that key no longer exists so it's there just as an example so don't try to submit over my old key that won't that won't work you need to use your key don't use one of your friends keys um, you shouldn't share your keys with each other because and don't give somebody your key because then they'll submit over top of what you've submitted there and that'll probably be bad so if you have a bad key you're going to get message forbidden return to you i do put some checks in there so make sure you have underbar class one as part of your file name because this submit process it sends me your source code and it sends me your output. And it does a preliminary sort of uh, check of your assignment. So it doesn't completely grade it, but it will, it will tell you back if your data looks reasonable or not. So if, my, so if it tells you that your data set does not have the right number of rows, that's always bad. That means that means that's definitely something I would I would take off points for because there's something wrong with your program if you don't have the right number of rows. It will tell you if you don't have the right columns. That's also something you want to fix. You can submit these as many times as you want. So it, I have a basic check on there that will catch some of the most common errors just to let you know uh, before you and you don't need to do anything to tell me that it's the final one. Whatever, whatever one you last submit and the due date rolls and, and I go through them all, that's, uh, that's when you, that's the one that I, that I take. And when I start grading them, too, I flip a flag that basically says, okay, assignment one can no longer be submitted. That keeps us from running into the problem of I started grading and halfway through somebody submitted something new and um, and another common problem you might see is can't find source file so if you give it a bad file name and it can't find it you do have to make sure that underbar class 1 or class 2 or class 3 is part of your file name otherwise Otherwise, the program throws an error because if you tell it you're if you tell it you're submitting assignment two, but it sees underbar class one is part of your file name, it's figuring that you probably made a mistake, and you don't want to submit class assignment one as class assignment two because that would be that would be that would not be a good grade. All of the all of the modules and the homeworks have this section that I call helpful functions the course recordings eventually get to every single one of these these are just a couple of functions that I give you that I don't explain them all at, at at the beginning and there's not that many of them these are just several functions that are mostly used for pre-processing your data so encode numeric range remove outliers these are all basically using something called pandas and we'll get to them one at a time and what I used to do the first semester is rather than just give you every single one that we're going to cover I would sort of slowly reveal them as we had it but then we ended up with a different version for each module as it was slowly revealed and students would copy an earlier version by mistake so now they're they're all the same they're exactly but these are just helpful functions. The only one that we won't go through is the one at the very, very end, which is submit. And this one is what you use to submit your assignments. So this is just something that I wrote. All it does is just a little web service. It takes your data and your file that you give it, and it basically just posts it using HTTP. It's a web service to my um or to the to the page that's designed to accept those and then it 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 checks it and gives you the uh, response back every assignment i give you sample code just to get you started for assignment number one 
The sample code is all you need. All you will need to change on assignment number one, and there's a whole video that shows you how to do it. Put your key in there, put your path in here. Your path will be different depending on your operating system, but find, find where you have put it. Don't name yours your name. Um, put your name in there. And this is just building a simple data frame. All that this data frame here is, it's basically four rows with three columns. So there's a column A, a column B, and a column C. And so there's, there's four rows total. So column A has 0, 0, 1, 1. Column B has 0, 1, 0, 1. Column C is 0, 1, 1, 0. So this is just a very simple um, data set. You submit it. You give it the name of your file. So that's your source file. Comes from there. You, get, you always give it a data frame. Your key is your student key. And then number in O, this is assignment one. So if I run that, and I put no equals equals two, I would get an error because that class one there would not align to, to, to two. So make sure you do that when you submit it. When you submit it, it's going to say something like that, submitted assignment one for Jay Heaton. You have submitted this nine times. If you really want to submit your assignment nine times and check it nine times, that's perfectly fine. There's no limit on how many times you um, assign it. Don't put it in a loop and do it in a dial of service attack on me. That's not nice. But um, and it says no warnings on your data. You will probably do well, but no guarantee. So as far as how I grade these. Each of these sort of has five points possible. Just doing a successful submission probably means you'll get one point. If you're getting no warnings on this, and that's probably, you're probably doing quite well. You're prob you probably have perfect output. You may or may not. There might, it doesn't catch everything. Um, and I do look at the code as well. I mostly glance, I glance, I mean, obviously there's, it's weekly and there's 30 of you, so the ones whose output is not matching mine, I look at much closer than the ones who are um, matching up perfectly. You will sometimes get a warning. It takes the average of each column and it tells you how close your column averages are to mine. If you're a small bit off on my on the column averages, like maybe up to two, three, or four, that's not that is most likely not a problem. That's just neural networks are trained on random numbers. You'll never match exactly on those. So it I tend to explain it too in the assignment how close you should probably match up with mine. But that's just that's just to help you from not having just a real, I don't want to say dumb, but basic error on your assignment that I would um, uh, take off something for. If you want to check to see that the assignment is there, you can use this part. I only have this code on assignment one, but you can use it for any of the assignments. So if you ask it to show you a listing of all your submitted assignments, it will show you all of them. Assignment, I mean, at the time I ran this, I only had assignment one on there, but it would list them all. If you want to see your comment on each one, just do display, submit, key comma one, key comma two, et cetera, and you can easily look at those. So like I said, this whole um, uh, assignment submit process is something very new that I am checking out. For now, I'll say let's just go ahead and submit these through this completely. You don't need to, um, if you've submitted it through this and you can see that it's submitted, you don't need to actually submit, submit your source through Blackboard. You can. 
uh, doesn't, but it's it's not necessary. I may change that if we have some problems with this. I may uh, I may have you submit it in in both places, but submitting it through the code lets you uh, lets you basically have a have an easy check to see if your assignment is is pretty close to what I'm expecting. Also the so the ten assignments and then there's the Kaggle project and then the sort of final project they are um, those are submitted through blackboard and that's it that's the whole that's the sum total of the assessment part of the class that you're uh, that you're graded on any questions about assignment submission or that sort of thing Okay, I am going to go ahead and pass around a sign-in sheet. Um, again, I updated for ads and last-minute drops, so if you're not on here, uh, write your name in at, at the bottom. So if you've ever used command line get before, so there's several ways that you, I mean, you can download the zip file and that's perfectly fine. The only thing maybe a little bit annoying with downloading the zip file is if I do happen to, as I do add um, material to the class, so like I'll add the Kaggle assignment and I'll add the final project information probably in about a month, you would need to re-download the zip file or you wouldn't, you wouldn't have that information. If you are using if you are using the command line version of get What you do is you go to get, you click on clone download, you copy, you copy that little get URL. Instead of doing download zip, you copy that URL that they give you. And you do get clone and then that. Okay, it didn't go to my clipboard, but if it had, you would do get clone and that, and then I've already checked it out, so I can't run that command anyway. But this is what it looks like once you've um, downloaded it. The one thing that is very, very nice about the get command line as opposed to some of the as opposed to downloading the zip. And so I've already downloaded it. It's in my SQL and users projects. I just have a directory called projects that has every get project that I'm dealing with. You can do get pull. And if I've made any changes to it, me the professor has made any changes to it, get pull. Now mine asks me for a passcode, yours won't. The reason it asked me for a passcode is because I own that repository. I can change it. You can't. Or we'd have all kinds of problems. Um, and notice, I've made, I've made a few changes to it. The reason, so I have several computers that I use, and this is actually how I keep them all in sync. I use get my, for, on my own projects. So, that immediately gets everything completely synchronized and um, everything up to date for you. Then we use Jupyter Notebooks. So the easiest way to get into Jupyter Notebooks is I usually just go in, into DOS, go right to the directory I want, wherever my project is, and I just type Jupyter. Now it's J-U-P-Y. T-E-R. 
By the way, where that name comes from, Jupiter, if you're a computer languages, um, aficionado, JU means for a programming language called Julia, PY is Python, TE is text as of Don Knuth fame. If you've ever written an academic computer science paper, you probably know what TEX is, T-E-X, LaTeX. Um, and then R, the R programming language, which is very, very common in data science. They've also just come out with Kira's for R. So in theory, you could do this class entirely in R if that was your language of, of choice. None of the uh, course material would line up exactly though, but Jupyter, and then just notebook. And it launches Jupyter Notebook. What's very, very neat about this is Jupyter Notebook is actually sort of a website. So once it gets around to it, you'll notice it launches a browser. So this browser is not hitting anywhere on the internet. It might be using the internet a little bit, but you'll notice it says localhost. This browser is running completely on my website or on my my computer. So you still have you still have this console window open that you launched it from. Whatever you do, don't close the console window. That's your web server. That is what is powering Jupyter Notebook. What is very neat about this, and I will demonstrate it during class meeting four, I believe. I talk about GPUs a little bit, and if you're in, if you're doing serious, serious deep learning, you probably want to use GPUs. So what I will show you how to do with with a GPU, and that's your graphics processor. So this computer that I'm using right here is a Microsoft Surface Book. It's got a, for laptops, it's got a decently high-end GPU in it, but I mean, it's a laptop. It's, it's only so much you can do with a GPU in a laptop before it melts the laptop. So, uh, I mean, these, the real GPUs, they're these big honking boxes. I mean, they take up two slots in your computer's case. But the way I use GPUs, I used to install those very large GPUs and put a thousand watt power supply in my desktop. And uh, my first GPU it that I used for AI, it generated so much heat and I had such a cheap desk. It was not a solid wood desk. It was like Ikea or something. The fan or the heat coming out of it actually caused the the kind of fake wood finish to just peel right off. It was it's pretty awesome, um, but <laughs> it's the the newer GPUs. I've seen a, uh, a colleague of mine does have one set up at home. It's it's awesome. It's twenty five hundred watts. You boot that computer up, the lights dim briefly. It's like turning the vacuum cleaner on. It's it's. I used to set up machines like that. I don't anymore. I run them through Amazon Cloud now. And I'll show you how to do that. And what's very cool about Amazon Cloud is you can do all kinds of neat things through that. So this web address, localhost, that doesn't have to be my computer. I can show you how to set up in the cloud a GPU <coughs> instance. The one that I usually use has just a single GPU but a high-end GPU, it's 90 cents an hour. And one of the examples that I'll run towards the end, end of the class, it, it's a, especially if you're doing computer vision, you wanna use a GPU. It runs for about an hour and a half using my Surface Book CPU. It runs for about 40 minutes. So an hour and a half down to 40 minutes is great using this computer's GPU. So even a laptop GPU is pretty cool. If I run it on that 90 cents an hour um, instance on Amazon, between two and three minutes. So it's major, major power in the type of thing that you want to use. 
You can also, um, one thing that you used to be able to do, and hopefully we'll be able to do again on Amazon, is you can buy, you can pay for instances that are not being used. So GPU instances that are not being used, you can do spot pricing and get them cheaper. Usually, thanks to Bitcoin miners, that is, there's just none of those available right now. So um, spot pricing doesn't work too well, but you can, I mean, you can get, I think the most expensive GPU instance is maybe $14 an hour, if I remember right. So what's neat about that is, I know when I was doing a, for one academic paper I was working on, I wanted to prove that it was scalable. So I don't want to buy that 14, that $14 an hour machine, if I were to build it, is probably about 70,000 bucks. I don't want to own that machine and have it sitting in my basement, but if I just want to rent it for, I don't know, three hours to show that my algorithm scales and can make use of it, that's a very, that's a very cool use for AWS. So we'll, we'll see more of that um, as, as the class progresses. Okay, so now that I have Jupyter running, You can basically click on any of your um, notepads that are, or notebooks that will show you. And I am basically opening up the first one. You've probably seen this for the first module because I, I can tell a number of you have already gone through this. But for every, every one of these that we will see, there's a weekly video update. So there's already one for week one. There will not be a weekly video update for this week because we're here. So the weeks that we have class sessions, in this little part, what I will put is the recording from tonight. So you'll, you'll see that. And by the way, if you like YouTube and you want a just a YouTube playlist of everything, I don't know if you want to just binge watch the class or something like that. I can't imagine a worse fate. Um, you can click on that and and completely watch through the entire um, the entire playlist. You do want to look on um, you do want to look on the um, the the Blackboard site too because that's where you'll see your grades and but all the material is going to be in GitHub. I'll probably. Um, I'll, I'll put additional information, I mean, I might put some additional information in Blackboard and definitely pay attention to the announcements in Blackboard. I'll e I always send them out through email as well, so you'll, you'll get that. Each video lecture has approximately three parts that run 15 minutes to maybe 25. So I tried to break them up into parts so that you you can get those um, so that you don't have to watch literally the whole thing in, in sort of one one setting. And if you're going back later to find information, you can um, do that. If you prefer more textual, all of these parts are basically I take you through the material that I have here and show you some additional things. So I modify the code and do just a couple of sort of what if changes to it just for uh, for understanding. Only the first class has these three, but basically you have your option of three different ways to install this. So there's uh, Windows, Mac, and you do have another option altogether. If you don't want to install this on your computer or if your computer is not strong enough. If you've got four to eight gigabytes of RAM, I don't give you any giant monster big data style data sets in this. Otherwise, I would have to talk wash you into um, providing some sort of cloud account for for each of you uh, to to really give you that much that much processing power. But we're I do show you some examples of large data sets, but uh, 
to get through all of the assignments, you, you will not need to do that. And then you have the helpful um, functions. These are all of the assignments, sort of by the module assignments by name. The simple test assignment, I'd have to look at the syllabus, but I think that is due in a couple of days. So most of you have submitted it already, but make sure. Yeah, it's due on 124. Yeah, so it's due on Wednesday, end of day. So make sure you've submitted it by then. If you have trouble submitting it, send me a um, email. I will warn you on emails, I, I almost always respond to student emails within 24 hours, but I am, I'm an adjunct professor, so I teach just this one class. My day job, I am a lead, da I am lead data scientist at RGA which is an insurance company here in town. So if you email me during the middle of my workday, I may or may not get to you during the day. So just keep, keep that in mind. So usually during the evening is when I uh, respond to emails. I do check it during the weekends as well. So, I'll, so I realize a weekend is a common time to finish a lot of these. Your second assignment, let me just briefly show you that one because this one you do need to modify uh, some code. You always want to, if you're running this through Jupyter, you always want to make sure that you, oh hold on, okay and don't do this mistake that I just made. So I had launched um, I had launched my Jupyter Notebook, but I'm actually on, on Get. So you can view all of this stuff through Get, you just can't run it. And I was like, where's my Run button? Uh, so did I manage to close that? Okay, so yeah, you can tell the difference. This little icon up here is the get logo, which is the Octo Kitty. Uh, that's that's their um, that's their logo. This little one here that has the sort of um, sun with the moon in front of it that is that is Jupiter. Or I guess that's the planet Jupiter. So this one, if I go into here now, I oh that's okay. I know it's wrong. <laughs> My hyperlinks in all of these go to the website. So if I do want to look at assignment two, what you've got to do is click on the folder and then go to assignment two. So there, there's that. So one of the questions that I answered for a student is, if you get an error that says it can't find the submit function, that just means the submit function is not defined, so make sure you run this part first. And how you know a cell has run, it has a little star there, that means it's running. As soon as that star changes to a number, then it's done running. Most of this stuff will be pretty instantaneous at first, but some of it will take, will take longer. Oops, let me go back to the tab. So assignment two, what I am asking you to do is just a very, very simple data manipulation. So I assume that you may or may not know Python. I assume that you've probably worked with at least another programming language. So you kind of pick, pick up Python as you go with this, uh, with this course. Python is by all means one of the most common languages for uh, for AI and machine learning. There are other, I mean, Java, deep learning for J uh, is, a, is a common way to do that. Maybe heavy duty academic, you would do a programming language called Torch. Have any of you worked with Torch? Okay, that's why we don't do it in Torch. <laughs> so how many of you work, have worked with Python before? Okay, yeah, about half, maybe a little over half. So that's, that's part of the reason we do Python. 
But Python is simultaneously one of the slowest and fastest programming languages that I've ever worked with. So if you do Python, so Python is an interpreted language, and if you put it head to head against Java, it's going to lose every time. Um, however, what you do is you use augmented um, libraries like TensorFlow. So what TensorFlow does is it literally, as you express a neural network to it and you build up that compute graph, it uses your computer's built-in C compiler and it generates extremely highly optimized C code to, to execute your neural network. And that's deadly fast. And sometimes that will even beat handcrafted C code. And normally, um, the reason for that is somebody who's written a C program has compiled it to whatever machine he was using or whatever machine was the most common. So the optimizations for, were for whatever machine was the most common at that time. What TensorFlow does is it compiles it to the most optimal for the machine that it's running on. So that gives it an advantage to really execute the stuff very quickly. Now, if you just wrote a neural network from scratch, did all the summations and activation functions, and you wrote that in Python, and then you wrote the same thing in Java, yeah, the Java one would be, unless you're a really bad Java programmer, the Java program would be much, much faster. But using, using Keras and using TensorFlow, you get all of that optimization and GPU usage too for free. You don't have to program anything differently to use the GPU. It's just all automatic. Okay, so for this assignment, this assignment does not use any neural networks at all. It uses just Python and pandas. So pandas we learn about in the first two modules. So the first two modules are just kind of a review of Python and then pandas. Pandas is the data processing component for this. So pandas let you load in CSV files, which are kind of like spreadsheet files, process, process that data in some way, and then send it to the, to the neural network. The thing that's very neat about pandas is pandas is based on the R programming language's data frame. And in my job as a data scientist, I'm always working with R and Python. So for me, having Pan, that's part of the reason pandas is so popular is you don't have to relearn a whole set of instructions for R and Python both. You're learning the data frame. So if you learn Python in this class and then you go take a class in R, you'll find that the R data frame is very, very similar to the pandas data frame. So this just tests to see if you're able to do this is the assignment that's due next week. So this assignment just tests to see that you're able to modify a file. So this is the file that you're modifying. Most of the files that we work with for the assignments are generated files that I, they're data sets, but they're not real data sets. That lets me re that lets me generate them for um, each semester, and I can I actually use a fairly complicated program to generate them, but I can make the generated data expose sort of the features that I really want to demonstrate. So if I want to demonstrate high correlation between two columns, I can I can generate that or other things. This link takes you to the sample file or I mean not the sample file, the real file. So this is the, this is the data set. Most of my data sets do have an ID field. That's just the, that's just sort of the primary key. Because sometimes I will have you break this into test and train and I'll have you submit part of it back. So the IDs let me know which row it, it, it belongs to.
So I tell you to see assignment one for more information on submitting it. So you'll want to download that file and you want to modify it as, as specified. You can find sample code to do a lot of these sort of transformations in the module two um, source and also videos. So you most all of the information that you need will be in the in the website. But I will tell you how I if I find something in here that I do not know how to do, like drop the ID column, you can pretty much just Google is your friend. You can pretty much just the way I would search this is Python pandas. Often you don't even need Python or pandas. It's always humorous to me. I think Google knows my IP address and knows it's me, but occasionally I will search on something for Python or pandas and I'll see an animal, either a snake or a panda bear. But um, usually Google knows that it's, it's me and I'm not I did, I did once do a search on how to kill Python process, and it was horrible what I saw. <laughs> so um, don't do that one. OK, so Python pandas drop a column. See, Google's even auto-completing that for me. So it's, it's a com that's always a good sign. Google's auto-completing exactly what you want. So it will often show you pan, so it'll show you the, the instructions, panda data frame drop. Yep, that's definitely what you will be using. Then your, those are good to look at. Those can be a little verbose. They'll usually give you an example though. Often stack overflow is very much your friend. And they basically tell you several uh, several ways you can do it. df.drop column name. I wish it would just leave it at my size. So like this one, df equals df.drop. So df is your data frame. df.drop, that's the name of the column you want dropped. The one means columns, so usually you don't want to drop, you might want to drop rows, but you don't want to drop rows in that case. You'll also notice this is a performance tip. This df.drop literally creates a whole new data frame just with that one column dropped. You can pass in a parameter called, in, oh, they explain it right here. Um, this is the more memory performance um, transformation. I mean, I was helping somebody at, at work who was dealing with a data frame and wondering why he was running out of memory. It's not even all that big of a data frame. Well, he had about 70 transformations like this, but he was all <coughs> df equals df dot this. So every single one of these that you do is now creating a new data frame. Now, there is some memory sharing that helps, but... This is, the, this is the more efficient way to do it. I don't necessarily care which way you do it, so long as you get the correct output. But that is always a way to, um, I mean, pandas transform column z-score is another common thing we'll do. Pandas compute z-score for all columns. Um, so definitely that is helpful. On the course website in um, Blackboard, I do have a couple of um, PDFs that I put there for Python introduction and um, pandas introduction. What I did is I went and found a pandas introduction that lined up pretty close to the stuff that we use in this in this course. So that might be might be useful to you. So drop the ID column, replace the missing values, NAs, so NA is not a number, not applicable. Um, 
with the that is a typo. I'll show you. Oops, I didn't mean to double click it. Replace the missing values in a with the media value, median value. <laughs> This is why Jupyter Notebook is quite cool. And then literally, what I'm able to do is save it. Oh, I'd have to break out of that. I don't want to do that. But so all I have to do is that. Oops. And now it's updated. So that's the very cool thing about about get. So you'll replace the NA values with the um, so that's a very common thing that you will do in this sort of processing, and the, the class video explains that. So you've got this whole column of numbers, maybe they're somebody's age, and then you find a value in the middle, or you find one that's missing, you just take the median of that whole column, and you, um, and, and you, replace, it, you replace the median value for it. And there's examples of how to do that. By the way, the more advanced case of this is, say you have a particular column, and these are, these are individuals. So when you get into, so dealing with missing values is always, um, an interesting case. If you have values, so often taking the the median is a good way. You can take you can take the um, average of it as well. If you're dealing with categorical values, you can take the mode. So just the most common commonly occurring one. Often you'll want to plot a distribution of those. So just to show you sort of one, so if you have if you have ages, it's fairly reasonable that you just take the um, average the average age. If you're taking say BMI, body mass index, something that we deal with in my field, if you're missing people, you could take the you could take the uh, the average of that. If you did the average of ages, and it would probably be a nice, that's a horrible normal distribution, but that's as close as I can draw it. Your ages would look something like that. But if you plotted something like a BMI or some other biological type indicator, you might get, I would want that a little more pronounced, but you might get a double, a double bumped um, distribution, which is also called a multimodal distribution. Anybody know what that usually means if there's two bumps? It's usually the genders. So if you're dealing with biological data, um, particularly life insurance data like I often deal with, and there's two, you have a multimodal distribution, it usually means that you have males and females. So BMI, the average BMI for males and the average BMI for females is different. So a better approximation in this case would be you would take the you would take the field gender, calculate the mean or the uh, median um, BMI for males for females, and then you would replace it according to what the gender of, of each person was. So if you ever hear the term multimodal distribution, that's basically what it means. It's a, it's a distribution that has, it's a bell curve type thing, but there's more than one bump on it. Also another thing in academics, if I ever take, 
a class and I take all of the students grades and there's two bumps what's that usually mean cheating <laughs> it usually means that basically there's two groups so there's one group and then another group that had um, an unfair advantage and usually even if even if in the cases there's all kinds of YouTube videos about that there's a very famous one where they actually cheated in a statistics class <laughs> of all the classes not to cheat in <laughs> that is not the one to so the uh, yeah so the professor showed that and then he showed and he explained that the reason that there's two bells is even the students who got a copy of it some of them still can't execute a perfect score and um, you have the normal bell so you have two bells but that's that's the kind of thing that data scientists look at is and that's one of the first things i'm looking at is there's all kinds of distributions but i want to know the distribution that it's in if it's if it's multimodal um, very common in biological data. Okay, speaking of, I don't really, I don't really consider this cheating, but I more want to just warn you, because I've had students accidentally submit one of these. Um, gosh, what's it called? Oh yeah, Course Hero. Hero, WSTL, Jeff, Heaton. So if you go to this site, one thing that is interesting, this is, this is just like the files that back when I was um, a university student that fraternities and whatnot kept on every single. The only thing I will warn you on this one is they do have completed assignments from my course. This would work a lot better if it wasn't deep learning and I didn't recreate the assignments each semester. So you'll see assignments literally posted here from previous semesters. Go ahead, you can definitely, um, I think they charge you money though to look at them, but don't just submit one of these as is because they've completely changed. So don't do that. I always, each semester have one student who does that. You'll just get a zero on it, is all, because your 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 answers will be incorrect, because they um, and this class has been majorly rebooted. So they had the four. There used to be just four assignments. Now there's ten. So if you want if you want to see assignments one through four of the previous semester, don't pay them any money. Just email me. I'll gladly give you one. <laughs> Um, so, let's see, the only other thing, so yeah, and then I tell you replace the following columns with the z-scores. So landings, number, and pack, you change those with z-scores. I explain more about z-scores in the video, but it's, it's essentially if you're not, if you don't remember the statistical concept of a z-score, zero means you're exactly at the mean, and then plus or minus however many standard deviations away from the mean you are. The thing that's good about z-scores is if I tell you that I saved five dollars on an item, did I get a good deal? Um, if it's a backpack, maybe. If it's a house, not so much. If I tell you that I scored 95% on an exam, that means I did really pretty good. If I tell you that I got 20 points on an exam, you don't know if that's good or not. So it's a normalization. 20 points on a 200 point exam is pretty bad. 20 points on a um, 20 point exam is, is quite good. So what's good about this is it's all weights in the neural network. So some of the inputs, if you have one of your inputs is a very large value, like, I don't know, you're doing some sort of prediction on individuals. So maybe their house value, their salary, and then their age. Well, age is going to be a lot smaller than those other two. So Z-score is a way of mitigating those having a big effect. This one, and usually I give you a note, it is unlikely that you will have any submit warnings. 
on this one. So I, I mean, these are all exact changes. So you're, there's no randomness at all in this. So if you get any, if I, if my submission program warns you that your mean value on your columns is different than mine, it probably means you have an error. So that's um, something to, to check. And then these are all of the columns that your submitted one will have. If you're missing one of those, like I said, my submission checker will complain about it. And then for the uh, getting started code, this is by no means complete, but I just show you basically start by reading the file and then these are the three things that you, that you need to do. So each of the each of the assignments is about this level of complexity. You'll also have um, they they basically each one gives you a chance to use what we what we saw in each of the modules. And I have all of the assignments posted at this point, except for ten. I have not yet created ten. I got through just about all of them. Um, so if you do go to 10, it says assignment instructions coming soon. I will have 10 created by, uh, uh, by next week. I don't think anybody is going to work that far ahead, but if you do, you'll just have to wait a few weeks for me. Yes? So when we submit, we want all of our code. Um, what I, what I've worked with Jupyter Notebooks, I've kind of bunched it into like, um, pieces of code go into different cells. Yes. So like check them. Um, so at the end, you just want us to compile all that code into one. Nope. You one can cell. you can give me multiple cells, however you want. I mean. So so when we hit submit, it'll send you all of our. Yeah, it'll cells. send you the the whole file. The, oh, okay. Okay. Good. Yeah, because. That's right. It's the entire. Yeah, because you're giving me the file name to your yeah. IPYNB. And that is, that is one thing that's nice about, is you can also use an IDE. If you prefer an IDE, where you're just dealing with Python files, you click run, it runs the whole thing through. That can be, so if you're doing Jupyter Notebook and you do, a equals 10, print A plus 1, it's going to print 11. I mean, that's the, that's the Jupyter Notebook. You could also do markdown, so you can say pound sign means title, and that's a subheading. If you know LaTeX, you can even insert equations like that. If you don't, don't worry about it. Does it matter? What can be really nice about Jupyter Notebooks is these cells are interdependent. So if I do print A down here, I haven't defined A in the cell, but A is defined up here. Now, some of the assignments, especially the one assignment that I give you on convolution networks, so graphics processing, the neural network that I have you train there will probably take about 20, maybe 30 minutes to train. So what I suggest you do is put all of your training in one cell so that you only have to run that once. And then it's staying in there in memory, and you work on it then getting your submission correct the first time. And you don't have to keep retraining that 20-minute that 20 process. It'll just stay in memory. And that's one thing that's really nice about Jupyter. That's not so easy to do in a IDE. Now, I do also show you how you can save your neural network to a binary file. And that can be handy if you don't want to have to constantly run it. 
Okay. Yeah, so the structure is module one is the introduction to Python, module two is Python machine learning, and then module three is when you get into your first um, your first actual neural network that you will that you will create. Okay, while I am thinking of it too, did everybody get their name on the sign up sheet? And okay, yeah, go ahead and <laughs> Okay, so that is basically it for the um, the first part of the the material that I that I wanted to show you. Let me. The only other thing I wanted to show you too is. So as far as installing this too, a few questions that I was getting. This is also something that I want to update. I will probably just remove those version numbers. The version of TensorFlow that we're using is 1.4.0. Ignore that 1.2.1 that I have there. I will, um, that was from the previous semester. Fortunately, TensorFlow is not so bad about breaking changes anymore. And by the way, breaking change is when a framework like Python or Keras that you're using, they go to the next version and all the source code from the previous version doesn't work. That's a, that's a breaking change. So the, when I first taught this class, you basically had TensorFlow only worked on uh, Mac and Linux. So for my Windows students, I there was no way to run it. What you would do is, and I have instructions for that as well, there's the IBM Data Science Workbench. If you don't want to install this stuff on your computer, you check out the IBM Data Science Workbench. That works pretty well. I went through just a few weeks ago and ran everything in this class on Data Science Workbench from IBM. It's completely free. It's pretty cool. And you can basically just execute all of your code um, there. If you take these double equals off of this, it will just install the latest version of TensorFlow. So if you get version issues there, feel free to just install the latest. I don't think they've really updated it that much um, since, since this course has begun. Okay, so what I will typically do in, in these classes is to reserve about the last, um, the last half hour of it to, for any questions that people um, will have. That is really everything that I wanted to go through for the because like I said, everything's in the, in the actual class um, uh, recordings. Are there any questions just overall right now that anybody has? Okay. So like I said, you run into questions, definitely email me. Make sure you get the first assignment in there because it's due in, uh, it's due on Wednesday. And make sure you have a look at assignment two and get ready for that. 
that's all I really have for this is so this one will be a little bit shorter that's all I really have for tonight if anybody wants me to look at something individually this will be a good time to do it I also am available too to sometimes come or if you want to want me to talk to you before class as well okay that is the uh, that is the first one Thank you. 